Roland, thank you very much for spending some time with me on the topic of a strong digital Europe. What is the impact of digital on the industries that Siemens is operating in? I have to say that this, the impact of the digitalization on our industries is massive. Um, could it be the healthcare market, the energy market, the industrial market, infrastructure, mobility? In all cases, you see that digitalization is changing the way how, how the market works, the business models, um, the value proposition, even the competitors are changing. It's not only digitalization technologies, it's also normal technologies. So this mix creates really a kind of a explosive mix, which really makes markets changing very, very fast. We live in an age where the focus on societal challenges is a necessity. Climate change, energy transition, digital transformation and its impact on jobs. What is your vision about these challenges? We have to take these challenges very, very serious uh, for many, many reasons. One of them, which I would like to add, is also that you have a, a problem in, in the middle class. The middle class is diminishing, which is another challenge um, which, is, which is coming in. This brings me back to a discussion which we have all over again would digital technology, AI technologies in particular, eliminate jobs or not. So um, I do believe it doesn't. Um, it will change jobs, but it will not change, uh, take jobs away. New technologies help economies grow, and growth always comes with jobs even jobs which you don't know today. Secondly, um, we are living in an aging society and a big portion of the GDP in the past was created by incremental labor going to the market. An aging society means that the labor market is diminishing. If we want to maintain our growth rate of economies, we have to compensate that with technology, driving productivity. We have to look into the, the way how we are using resources. I mean, we, we talk about CO2 but it's all resources which we are consuming, which we have to bring into a circular economy in order to really take care about the way how we're using them and how much energy we are using to produce them or using to run our system, which is obviously a big, big problem which we have. I do believe that a lot of answers lies in technologies. There's another answer which I would like to give. It's a high level yet, but I do believe this is a, a big, big answer is education and training. Um, we do need to educate and train our people. The importance, you can recognize that um, you train them with the cycle of your technology, but if the cycle of technology for digitalization, which comes in, shortens, developing a, a, a coding for a gas turbine plate it can take whatever, five years, seven years until it comes into the market. Software can come in six months. So that means the technology cycle is shortening, hence the education cycle has to shorten, lifelong learning comes into place. If you put a lot of emphasis on this one, we solve a lot of problems um, in, in many, many dimensions, including, for example, addressing um, the problem of the, of the middle class, including the, how, how we get people into the market and, stay, and make them stay relevant in the market too. Europe has been left behind when it comes to digital platforms, uh, especially with respect uh, to the US and China. What is the digital platforms that Europe should focus on in the next decade? It's true. Um, Europe lost the first battle on B2C, business to consumer platforms. Seven out of the ten most valuable companies in the world are platform companies. Five of them sit in the United States, two of them sitting in China. However, when, when we talk about IoT or industrial Internet of Things, um, we see that this wave is coming up now. That means these platform technologies are rolling now into the industrial space. Manufacturing, uh, mobility, healthcare, you name it, energy. Europe should focus on really shaping these kind of platforms because we do have a very strong industrial footprint. We know how to build trains. We know how to automate manufacturing sites and process industries. We have a very strong uh, industry also regarding the energy system. We should build on our strengths, having the strong know-how, have a strong industry, yet we have to add new technologies, digital technologies, cloud technologies, where we run the platforms, as well as building an ecosystem. 
it takes time and you have to really understand the mechanisms. Otherwise, you end up in doing either another product business or you might uh, do some software business, but platform is different. But then we have a very, very good starting point to be the front runners in creating industrial IoT platforms. How do you see the entrepreneurial culture across Europe and how are we doing globally when it comes to entrepreneurial culture, especially in digital? If you talk about all the changes which are happening in the market, um, on digitalization, the speed with technologies running into markets and the eventual disruptiveness, it, it calls definitely for a new kind of entrepreneurship which we, which we see. The startup scene is, is growing, you know, that there's uh, I think there's something like 40% more capital rolling into the startup scene within, within the last one or two years, it's a substantial amount of money, um, which tells you that it seems that there's a demand for a different kind of entrepreneurship too. What's the difference between, let's say, an American entrepreneurship and, and, a, and a European one? I know maybe I'm generalizing too much, but still, I, I give you that. Number one is forgiveness for failure. Um, and maybe I'm a little bit, see that a little bit too much from a German perspective because we want to do everything perfect. And doing something perfect doesn't allow for failure, obviously. So there's a kind of a contradiction. You make your failures, you learn and start all over again. This is how you, how you learn. We should not celebrate failure. That's not the point, but we should learn from them very fast. In China, you, you start something, you try it, and if it doesn't work the first time, it's maybe good enough, but you make it better the second time. Fast iteration brings you also very fast to the place where you want to be. The second element I do believe, which, which I think we are differing a little bit, is I see the entrepreneurship in the United States is really asking for what kind of problem do you want to solve, what's the, the customer problem, and how do I monetize? In Europe, we start more with, I have a great technology, so let's look where the problems are um, or how can I solve it and later on maybe I think about how to monetize it. But we see very, very strong entrepreneurs in Europe too. And entrepreneurship again comes in, in two, w two ways, let's say one is the, st the growing something, the startup phase and then is running a, a sizable business. What would be your advice to a young ambitious entrepreneur that's starting out today and wants to build a global company here in Europe? If you study a little bit how Alibaba started, Amazon started, they had, this is like an exponential curve. Um, they started slow for many, many years, but then you have this inclination point where they took off. So it took them also quite a while to get there where they are, or to get to the first billion of revenue or market capitalization. The other element would be, of course, you if you're sitting in a huge market and you're blessed with an environment where you create your startup, you're, you're better off. I mean, if you're serving a 1.3 billion market, people market, um, obviously scale is, should be very fast if you hit the right, the right uh, buttons and, and you create customer value. So therefore, that would be one element uh, which I would give advice to companies to look into where they are their markets. But it does not necessarily mean that you, you cannot create a fast-growing startup out of Europe. Because since they know they're sitting in a no market, what would they do? They would just look at the globe and say, what is, whatever is the best market? Size and adaptability or demand. And they go there from the very beginning. So they might have the headquarters somewhere in a place locally, in Europe, for example, but still start deploying their, their technology, their platform in other countries. The second one is capital. Depending on your business model, you burn faster or slower. But regardless of what you do, you need to, to raise capital. That's something where I do believe we have in Europe still to think about. I think this is something we have to, have to really gear up a little bit and see how we can create uh, larger funds to do that. And the third element, which is of essence, is um, scaling brings you in a different model how you manage. Selling a piece of a software for a pilot is easy, but selling it for a customer who wants to use it for the next 10 or 15 years, this is completely different from making a cool pilot and, and show what you can do. So there are a lot of elements coming together, uh, but I'm pretty sure our entrepreneurs in Europe will figure that out. What kind of policy or regulation is needed in Europe for the European industry to thrive? We have now your, our new European cybersecurity law, GDPR. 
People would argue, oh no, and this is for, for personal data. People would argue and say, I mean, this hinders us from creating now digital business because it's all about data. And if you re regulate too much, then you hinder companies to grow. If you have a good regulation, you're a front runner on that. You can make sure that the people rely that my data are treated in a proper manner. Apparently a disadvantage could turn into an advantage because finally, ultimately, maybe the adoption rate is bigger because people are trusting more and feel in a safe environment. The other element is um, living labs. If you do not provide a space where you can define space, uh, confined space, where you allow test with autonomous cars and autonomous driving, how can you ever get there? The next one is 5G. You need to have a space where you develop that. This is something where regulation can and, and uh, policies come in and, and support um, easily. Um, another thing on policies is how much, how much money does Europe spend uh, on R&D? How we encourage research institutes and universities working together with companies or supporting startups and the like. There's a shortage of digital skills and there's under-representation of women in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. How do we overcome these shortcomings in mm. Europe? I wish I would have an answer. But uh, the shortcomings in uh, well-educated people, also the way how we have the diversity of people which are coming to the market is, is, a, is a problem which we obviously have. Which is a, it's, it's, a, it's anyhow a problem because Europe is not growing, the population is not growing. Maybe we have to work on our immigration policies too, because we want to attract also from other nations, uh, young people, uh, trained people. So um, that, that's a, a topic which we have to work on. One is, um, maybe it's a little bit, it's, I don't know if it's, it's Europe, it's Germany, we are a little bit, let's say, negative against new technologies. I mean, technologies are helping us to make, also to fight climate change. So we should be, should be here really in, in a more positive tone. That would mean then that more people would study. Also companies have to put more emphasis on, on education and training. The, it's tr it starts with the money you spend. Is it the right level? And then it's also with the, the tools which you're using. So one answer was we have to train on the job. But there's a new way of how you educate because you just do that on the job, which is, which is a very nice way to do. So there are a lot of elements which we need to do. We have to put, make great examples that we put uh, our, our young female leaders in place and create showcases uh, how they can grow in, in the company and lead from there. I'm fully convinced that diverse teams, this doesn't only talk about gender, but any kind of diversity, diverse teams are the better teams. They come up with better solutions, better results faster. Also in Siemens, we are not there yet. And we are also working very much on our image, how we can attract young people from this IT space too. I mean, many people don't know that Siemens is amongst the 10 largest software companies in the world. We have to change the perception and we make cool things too. So therefore, this is a, a lot of things which can do in order to really attract people uh, to study the, the new technologies, to embrace it, and of course then to deploy it in companies like Siemens or startups, for example. Roland, thank you very much for sharing your inspiring vision with me this morning for a strong digital Europe. Thank you, John. It was a great pleasure.